Well, hello, you Oregonians. Uh, we're coming to you from uh, La Quinta at the very end of June, and we're excited about getting our ambassador program launched. And uh, that we're hoping that you will come together, you folks in Salem and Portland, and maybe have a couple of smaller get-togethers and use this particular study that we're going to do uh, over the coming weeks. And of course, as many of you know, hopefully by now that I'm uh, myself and the Hermans are going to be there in late August, and we're sure looking forward to being with you. So anyway, I hope you really enjoy this study. Okay, you ready for this? Man, we're excited about this. So uh, anyway, let me give you a little backdrop. I tell you what, let's do this. Before we get started here, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together, even though we're doing it remotely through video. Lord, I thank you for every person that's involved. I thank you for every person that uh, cares about your word. We know Psalm 107, 20 that we're going to look at. You sent your word and you healed your people. So, Lord, I'm praying that you'll really inspire us, myself included, to really begin to share our faith in more profound ways and teach us through your spirit how to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, you ready for this? We're, I'm excited about this. Let me give you a little background on how this even started. I was, uh, some of you know, I was gone for about 10 days and I was in Europe on a working trip. And uh, I just kind of got, all of a sudden was awakened about two o'clock in the morning. And I had a very strange dream that I haven't completely, uh, I wrote it down and I really don't understand all of it yet. But you remember the prophet Joel said in the latter days, uh, young men are gonna, there are gonna be dreams and visions and all kind of thing and as God pours out his spirit. So I'm, I'm always sensitive, not all dreams, but some sense, I'm sensitive to some dreams that seem to make sense. And, and then I woke up with this little acronym in my head, which was ALL, -L, and all of a sudden, uh, I felt like I knew, and I got up and I just wrote all these things down and then went back to sleep and, and didn't even look at it till the other day. And then Constance approached me and said, hey, why don't we really want to do this remotely and have a little study, maybe do a little 15 minute intro and uh, maybe give some people some things to talk about. So that's the genesis of this little study that we're going to do. We're going to call it, how do you give your all for God in his kingdom? And then we're going to take that A-L-L and we're going to look at three parts. I want, to, I want to talk to you about giving your all and actually sharing your faith. You know, when you talk to people about sharing their faith, extroverts sometimes kind of a little bit, well, I'll share my faith sometimes. Even extroverts many times have said, well, I've never led anybody to Jesus. I, I feel uncomfortable. I'm afraid they're going to ask me a question I don't know how to answer. And, and it gets complicated. And we do need to, as we'll see, study to show ourselves approved so that we can be workmen that need not be ashamed, right? That's part of the Awana program that kids all over the country and I think all over the world work with trying to understand this Timothy passage that Paul had written Timothy. But let's make it more simple. If you want to give your all and you do have an increasing desire to share your faith, we're going to make it simple. First of all, three things, three parts. Ask, part of the all, ask, and then listen, and then love. So I want to talk to you about those three parts. If, I'm if I encounter somebody, all the first thing I need to do, I need to ask questions. Well, even preemptive to that, I'll tell you this. Jesus said, and he was pretty serious about this, obviously he gave us the Great Commission in Matthew 28. But listen to what he said in Matthew 9, verse 35 through 38. He said, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now, so you know, the heartbeat of Jesus was like he looked at the world, and that included me before I knew him, and just saw lost sheep wandering the hills, no shepherd. Easy prey, easy prey, easy pickings for Satan, and dispirited and discouraged and, well, you can see it. We even talked about that in the last few sermons. We've talked about the rash of suicides that have begun to take over our country, it seems. And it's not just anecdotal. We've seen a real rise, about 30 percent uh, in the last, say, 10 years in the suicide rate. What's going on here? People are so dispirited. They need the message, not just that Jesus saves but they need the entirety of the message of the gospel, how they can be made whole again. So first part, if, you're, if God's opened a door for you, first of all, recognize that God's the one who opens those doors. If God's opened a door, don't feel like you have to be Bible answer woman or Bible answer man and always just give everybody and just have this Billy Graham kind of 
conversation with everybody where it's a dialogue, it's, excuse me, a monologue and not a dialogue. You know, one of the amazing things about Jesus and the early disciples is that they actually ask questions. You know, they ask questions when they encountered somebody. I think of blind Bartimaeus that we see. And Jesus approached, uh, was walking through, and he began to yell out, Son of David, Son of David, you know, and, and he, was, he was just, heal me, and he, he was so desperate. And Jesus stopped, and they, and they were trying to quiet him, and Jesus stopped, and he, and, and he made his way. Some, obviously, some people helped him to get to Jesus. First thing Jesus did, ask a question. He said, well, what do you want me to do for you? He says, I want you to heal me. And, of course, then Jesus did, and he says, your face made you well. The first thing Jesus did when he encountered somebody that didn't know exactly who he was or exactly what was going on, first thing Jesus did was ask a question. It's so simple, you know? You don't feel like you have to get in an environment where you just immediately bombard people with things. Just the simplicity of a question is profound. I also think of the lawyer in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, approached him, and the first thing that Jesus did is ask him a question. Jesus said, well, what is written in the law? He asked him, well, what are the most important of the commandments? And Jesus then asked a question, well, what, what's written in the law? And then he says, and how does it read to you? In other words, well, what do you think about this? You know, it's something simple that you can be around somebody and somebody says, well, I don't believe in that. Well, rather than saying, well, you need to believe in this and this is why, what about, well, explain what you believe and explain. And it's amazing the power when someone's able to begin to speak. Many people have never really articulated. They've never heard it come out of their own mouth what they actually believe about God and about reality and about you know something that extends beyond that and sometimes when they can hear it come over their own lips I think they'll be taken aback at times I've, I've encountered that where people say well that just doesn't make any sense I remember a particular case when I was talking to somebody about Jesus and began to ask some questions and said well what do you believe and they began to articulate it and I, you could see the look in his eyes he was actually a professor at a university and he began to think, well, this is an absurd thing that I believe. I, I really, it just, I think it was maybe the first time that he'd really allowed him, himself to actually talk about what he believed, you know, uh, beyond what we see, taste, touch, and feel. So ask those questions. And then thirdly, I think about the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, Philip was sent by the Spirit to go down on the road to Gaza. And what's really interesting, he approached the eunuch, and the first thing he says, he says, do you even understand what you're reading? Because he was reading the Bible. He was reading the prophet Isaiah, actually, at that time. And do you understand what you're reading? Notice he entered with a question and allowed a dialogue to begin, which I think is powerful. I had an experience this last week. Some of you uh, may have seen we're taping this just after our last uh, part where we dedicated baby Maddie, and we were at a restaurant, uh, a little celebration afterwards with the Herman family. And I just ran into the restroom and there was somebody and I just felt the Holy Spirit was, you know, kind of odd being in a bathroom. But I had a guy in there and I said, hey, how you doing? How you doing? And usually, of course, in a bathroom, you say, well, I'm fine, I'm fine. You don't, you don't ever look at anybody and, you know. And yet he, he stopped and he goes, well, I'm not doing that great. I, my, cl my clavicle bone is broken and, and it's, uh, I think it's shattered and I don't know what's going on. And, and immediately, because I had already uh, told some of the pastors, I was going to start praying for people in public. And I said, well, I'm a Christian. And I said, if you're comfortable with it, I've prayed for people, laid my hands on them, and I've seen people healed. I said, it's not all people are healed when I do that, but some people have been healed. And I'd be more than happy to pray with you if you're comfortable with it. And he thought for a minute, and he said, you know, I would be comfortable with that. And I put my hands on him, and I prayed for him. And then he began to just open up to me, and I asked him some more questions. And, but it started with, would you, would you like for me to pray for you? A simple question. And then he said he was depressed and a few of his friends had been, had been killed in this car accident and he'd been asking God questions. And, and, and I said, well, maybe God sent me to you today just right here in this bathroom. So it started with a question, could I pray for you? So um, that's fascinating to me. So that's the ask part. It's real simple. You can just predetermine some questions that you'd like to ask if you get in a situation that you may deem to be hostile or not open to the gospel. Just ask questions, just build relationship. And then here's the second part. You gotta listen. You know, Proverbs is full of people and the wisdom of those who listen. Listen to this verse, I love this, uh, with listening. Uh, Proverbs 20, verse five. A plan in the heart of a man is like deep waters, but a man of understanding draws them out. In other words, 
a guy has a picture in his mind or in his heart about what life is about or what his plans are, and then it's an amazing listener that can just stop and actually draw that out. And as I said earlier, they may be shocked at what actually comes out of their mouth. I think also about Acts chapter 17. The Apostle Paul was in Athens and he was aware of the poets and the prophets and when he went and met with the Areopagus that was there in Athens, it was amazing because, because what was, it, immediately it, what it said is that he listened to what the prophets were saying. He listened, he was attentive to what they were believing about reality. He was attentive to their philosophical discussions. And so even though he didn't ask a specific question, it was evident that he had been listening in advance. You know, when you're aware of contemporary situations and you're aware of kind of what's going on in people's minds, you're culturally adept. You know what's going on. We're not just in our holy huddles. You actually know what people are thinking and the arguments that people are buying into. It shows that you're a great listener. And then lastly, Proverbs 18, verse 13. You know, if you answer before listening, it's folly and it's shame and only a fool is the one who is interested only in revealing his own mind. A good listener is so powerful in the kingdom. If there's anybody ever on the planet that should have been one that just constantly told people the way it was, it was Jesus. And yet we see him in various situations with gentleness and grace and caring about the position of the other person and not just dominating and bulldozing through a conversation trying to get his point across. There were moments when he did, and there were moments where he had to be hard, and obviously many of the religious leaders encountered kind of a tough Jesus and the money changers and those kinds of things in the temple. Uh, but it's fascinating when you look at it. And then lastly, I want to talk to you about this, love. You know, the response is always love. How do you love someone? Once you've asked a question, once you've listened, how do you love? That has got to be spirit-led. You know, the Bible's pretty clear, love your neighbor as yourself. How would you like to be responded to? Think about the thoughts that you had in your pre-Christ days. What, what do you look back? How, who were the people who impacted you? Chances are they were grace-filled, loving people. Now, a love response can also obviously include the word. You know, as we said earlier, Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent his word and healed them in 1 Peter 3, 15. Be ready to make a defense. Uh, in the Greek, there are apologia, which is be ready to make an apology a defense, that's what we call apologetics, for the reason in which you believe. Be ready to do that, but do it and yet with gentleness and love and care and kindness. So remember, the Holy Spirit has to lead your love response. It may not be anything from the Bible uh, in your first encounter. You may, you may plant seeds relationally for a long time in somebody's life, having asked and listened and loved. And then lastly, I want to say this, you know, Rebecca Pepper, who's a great evangelist, listen to what she says. She says this, assume that your encounters with strangers are no accident, but God's planting, planning, excuse me, God messes with airline computers to delay flights. He messes with our cars so that we have the opportunity to talk with a mechanic or a tow truck driver. What examples of this have you seen in your own life? You know, this understanding of God's sovereignty and that people are strategically put in your life for certain moments in their life and it's not about you, the paradox is that, folks, this is what makes us energized. This is what gives us great joy in the kingdom when we know that we're serving Jesus by making him famous wherever you are, whether that be Washington or Oregon or Montana or Colorado or Chicago or Dallas or wherever you may be as you're looking at this little study. So I'm hoping this starts the conversation with you and your groups and that you have a great afternoon, evening, breakfast, whenever you're meeting with your other fellow CRD folks, I hope this is really encouraging for you and we're very excited to hear back about the results and what God does among you. We love you and we miss you and we certainly look forward to having you back in the fall.